but also UN guiding principles on business and human rights. What will the new OSH inclusion in FPRWs mean and what are the implications for South Asia? And now I want us to think of those questions in the framework of the realities that we work and that we live in. Given the informal economy, given the rural economy, how can we extend these guarantees to the most disadvantaged workers? How can we make sure that national OSH policies and programs work in favor for these workers? So this is something that I want you all to keep in mind. Uh, it will be an important part of the discussion. We'll have panel members reflecting on these key questions. And now, before I introduce the panel, I would like to hand over, if we have with us the Inspector General, Mr. Nasir Udin Ahmed, if he's with us today now, I would like to hand the floor over to him for introductory remarks. Uh, please advise if he's able to give those statements. Thank you. Thank you so much, Halshka. Yes, here, Mr. Nasir Udin Ahmed, the IG Daifi, he is here with us. Uh, sir, Excellent. if I'm kindly request you. Uh, yes, yes, sir. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, distinguished guest, United Nations organizer, moderator, and speaker of the panel, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon to all. A very warm welcome to everyone present here. I am delighted to deliver this opening address for the panel discussion on occupational safety and health held within the 2022 UN South Asia Forum on Business and Human Rights. Bangladesh is one of the fastest growing economies in the world. Despite the COVID-19 pandemic, our economy grew at 6.94 percent in the 2020-21 fiscal year within the improvement in both service and manufacturing sectors. Our stipulated goals and in Vision 2041 clarify focus on the sustainable growth of the country. We understand our responsibility in the global business environment and are committed to work towards the realization of business respect for human rights. The UN guiding principles on business and human rights provide us significant guidance concerning states' obligation to respect, protect, and fulfill human rights and fundamental freedoms, the role of business enterprise to comply with all applicable laws and to respect human rights, and the need for rights and obligation to be matched to appropriate and effective remedies when breached. The global pandemic of COVID-19 increased employers and workers' awareness of safety and health in the workplace and protection of worker rights and business community. Relevant national policy and strategies have been issued and implemented to tackle the pandemic. Despite significant challenges, Many workplaces have stayed resilient and taken proactive steps in responding to the needs of business and human rights. Human centered occupational safety and health management system with active worker participation have been recognized as a key for creating safe, healthy, and productive business environment. 
I am pleased to inform the audience that the government of Bangladesh, in close collaboration with employers and workers, developed and launched the first national plan of action on occupational safety and health 2021 to 2030, referring to relevant ILO occupational safety and health standard. Uh, I think uh, my colleague is uh, there. Uh, the publication is uh, here, uh, which is I yeah, uh, said. This demonstrates our genuine interest in creating safe and healthy workplace for all in Bangladesh, many employers and workers and developmental partners actively participate in the development and brought their voice and ideas to the national plan. Our national plan of action on occupational safety and health focus on eight priority area for national action, eight priority areas. Which is the first priority is to strengthen national or system such as legislative framework and tripartite consultation mechanism. Second is to further develop the effective OSH inspection mechanism. Then to promote national preventive safety and health culture through education and the mass communication and social media. To promote employers and workers OSH activities such as OSH risk assessment and active safety committees. Then to design and implement special OSH programs to hazardous and high risk occupation, including construction, mining, and other accident prone industries. Then to extend OSH protection to small enterprises and informal economy workplace. Since the majority of workers and employers in Bangladesh are engaged in this sector. Then to strengthening occupational accident and disease reporting system and publish report annually. Number eight is to promote OSH research, research, education, and training. Research, education, and training. The newly established National Occupational Health and Safety Training and Research Institute in Rajshahi will play an active role for this priority. National Plan of Action in Occupational Safety and Health 2021 to 2030 will serve as our strong roadmap for creating safe, healthy, and productive workplace in all economic sector and also for contributing to business and human rights. The national plan is also our vehicle to achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goal 2030, target 8.8, .8, which is protect labor rights and promote safe and secure working environment for all workers, including migrant workers, in particular women migrants and those in pre Carriers employment. The implementation of the National Plan of Action requires the support of everyone, including the government, employers, workers, organizers. We will make necessary provision for the effective implementation of the National Plan of Action. Ladies and gentlemen, Bangladesh is hoping that we will further exchange and promote global successful experience in OSH as an essential element 
of human right agendas in business. We never forget the Rana Plaza tragedy of 2013 in Dhaka, that is uh, Shabar, which killed at least uh, one on three plus minus workers and injured more than two five double zero. The disaster among the worst industrial accident on record evoked the world to, to the improvement needs of the poor labor conditions faced by worker. In response with the continuous support of our development partners and policy decisions from the government, our OSH inspectors have upgraded their inspection skill, applied innovative inspection tools, and progressively extended their OSH enforcement services to all economic sectors. In parallel, employers and workers in many workplaces have established their workplace safety committees and jointly identified and mitigated their safety and health risks day by day. I understand this workshop is very crucial for enhancing the practical application of international OSH standard for business and extending relevant OSH practice to small enterprises and informal economy workplace. In addition, we'll capture many opportunities for our future cooperation. I thank you for your kind attention and we wish everyone a fruitful panel discussion ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very you so much. much. Yes. Over to you, Holska. Yes. Thank you very much. Well, I would like to thank very much uh, for those excellent opening remarks from the Inspector General. It's really a privilege to have such distinguished guests with us today for this panel. And so it's very important as well to hear the background and the realities of the situation and also what we see as the most important elements of this discussion. So thank you very much. Now it is my honor and my pleasure to introduce to you the five panel speakers that we will have with us today. I'll briefly give um, an introduction to who they are, but I'll give a full presentation of their background before they speak. The way that we, this will work is I will provide two uh, main questions to discuss, and I will ask each panel member to take the floor for five minutes to present their opinions, uh, their views on the uh, question, and also their experiences, which would be the most important to this discussion. Uh, I would kindly ask also the panel, mem panel members to please keep their discussions to five minutes so that we can make sure everyone has appropriate time to discuss. Let me now introduce the five panel speakers um, to the audience. We have with us Ms. Chitra Khanna, Mr. Zahur Awan, Mr. Wahira Palipan, Mr. Arvin Francis, and Mr. Iqbal M. Hussein, who I believe is with us here in person. Now together with the panelists, we'll be uh, thinking about two main questions. First, we'll be thinking about how can we advance occupational safety and health and business respect for human rights in this new post-COVID world through the application of OSH standards and also UN guiding principles on business and human rights. What do these standards mean for us in reality? How can we implement them at the enterprise level to ensure that workers are protected? What are your views and your experiences? And also I would like our panelists please to consider what will be the key implications to business and human rights when occupational safety and health is added to the ILO's fundamental principles and rights at work, which we know will take place shortly this year. What will this mean in reality? What will this mean in practical terms for enterprises, for the sectors that you work in, 
for the workers uh, that you represent. How will this change the landscape of the world of work for South Asia and potentially beyond? So it is my pleasure now to start with our first panelist. We have Ms. Chitra Khanna, who will be first. Ms. Chitra Khanna is presently the head of the safety initiative at the Safe in India Foundation. She works with stakeholders to prevent accidents in factories of the auto supply sector chain. Uh, she has done a lot of work on occupational safety and health policy with many different auto brands. And she is an electrical and industrial engineer with many years of engineering work experience. It's a pleasure to have you here with us, Ms. Tana. Please, the floor is yours for five minutes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, we also thank the ILO India team to give us this opportunity to place the worker voices uh, in, in, at this forum. Uh, Soon, can I have my presentation, please? Uh, meanwhile, uh, Safe in India is a, uh, is a civic initiative of IIM Ahmedabad 91 alumni, uh, batch 91. In December 2014, we had a, a media article which said 20 workers get injured, lose their hands and fingers every day in Gurgaon, which is in Haryana. And this prompted our, our co-founders to do a safety, uh, to do an assessment at the field and it resulted in, uh, in the opening of our first worker assistance center in Manesar in 2016 in Haryana. Next, please. As we helped uh, 3,500 plus workers, the informal employment within formal uh, sector was very evident. As you can see, 92% are migrants, 81% have done their education, not completed the education till class 10, Salary, 71% uh, get less than 10,000 rupees salary for eight hours work. 70% are in contractual employment and 62% of the injured workers are below the age of 30. 80% of these workers work in supply chain of auto sector and 75% are in the tier two, three, four of automotive supply chain, which is the, uh, which is, uh, which are part of MSMEs. Next, please. Yeah. To add to the problems, we have that the ESIC registration card is not given to workers on the day of employment and about 60 to 70% of the workers receive it only after they are injured in, inside these factories. That is, it is also uh, seen that more than 50% of the injured workers are first taken to private hospitals rather than ESIC hospitals uh, for, it, for their first aid treatment post injury. We also see that 47% of our workers work in shifts of 12 hours or more uh, while they are working in these factories. Post-COVID lockdown, we saw a difficult situation. The workers were told, if you are unwell, please don't come to work. And there was no pay, obviously, for, the, for not coming to work. The, uh, when the vaccination started, they were, said, they were told that no vaccination, don't come to work. The temperature testing was done at the work sites, at the place of work, but there were no periodic rapid antigen or RT-PCR tests to ensure that you know, they are safe uh, from COVID. Uh, along with our other uh, COVID uh, initiatives, we also conducted a vaccination camp for about 1,000 workers. Next. Now, here, uh, uh, you know, this, uh, we present the OSH situations and the, uh, the dilemmas our workers face, the diminished lives they face post accidents in our report series of crushed and safety NEPI. Uh, crushed series, we have uh, our annual reporting, we are reporting it since 2019. And our safety NEPI uh, report we started in 2021, wherein uh, we, we have placed the OSH policy in public domain as declared by the top 10 auto sector brands, auto brands in India. And the UNGP 2011, the, um, uh, the SDG 2015, the ILO Centenary Declaration 2019, and the International Reporting Frameworks form the basis from form the reference point for us in addition to our own OSH policy 2009, the, the Factories Act uh, 1948 and the Business Responsibility Reporting as uh, mandated by SEBI for the top 1,000 listed companies in 
um, in India, which will now be known as actually business reporting and sustainability reporting, BRSR reporting from the next financial year. So some of our recommendations to the industry and government, which must be applied you know, across sectors, whether formal or informal, is that the OEM boards, the brands should take the responsibility for worker safety in their deeper supply chain. We are also looking for OSH task force, industry level OSH task force uh, to you know, uh, set standards, to set sector standards for occupational safety and health. As far as the policy goes, we are looking to industry uh, to have the policies uh, you know, for their own contract workers, to have a supplier code of conduct, to have a standard operating procedure for supply chain factories, which will enable uh, uh, OSH to be institutionalized within the actual working of the uh, supply chain and specifically the deeper supply chain. Yeah, next. For government, uh, you know, advancing OSH through application of ILO standards and UNGP, we feel that there is a need to define decent work for all sectors. There is a need for us to set national targets and reporting for indicator eight of uh, SDG eight. And there is also a need for industries to report on GRI 403, uh, which will enable uh, uh, ensuring that safety reaches the, deep, uh, the last year of uh, suppliers. We, uh, we, have, we recommend the government to have uh, drive calibrated actions uh, to achieve the objectives of policy uh, 2009, our OSH policy, to use the accident data from ESIC to make inspection schedules, strengthen the role of ISH to prevent accidents, and writing the norms of safety, working and safety conditions in simple language with methods of measurement uh, possible uh, so that a common worker understands what are his rights and uh, duties. We also look for simplified sectoral safety uh, audit protocols specifically for the MSMEs. Next. Now, as we advance uh, uh, OSH through this application, uh, we are looking for establishment to have a written and publicly displayed OSH policy for all workers. When we talk of fundamental, uh, you know, including OSH as a fundamental provision, I think it will be an enabler to rise over the thresholds set in laws and provide OSH for all workers in our country and world over. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much for that overview. I think you very succinctly uh, summarized the responses to the question from your perspective in the local setting. It's very important to hear that. And thank you for keeping to the time. Uh, we very much appreciate that. Two takeaways from your presentation that I found interesting. The first, uh, that it was very important to distinguish efforts at different levels. So at the operational level, at the policy level, there were specific actions and priorities chosen. And I think that's very important because we can never work at just one level. We need to have a complementary approach, an integrated approach. So thank you for showing us that. Also, I think a good, a key good practice and perhaps a lesson learned that we can take away from here is applying the language and the provisions of the international labor standards and translating them to that simple language, writing the norms in a simple language that all stakeholders can understand. Because it's true, if we have these legal frameworks that are not interpreted correctly, then they don't serve much purpose. So thank you very much for giving us insight into to that very practical perspective from India. It's much appreciated. We'll now move on to our next uh, panelist to also understand the questions from their perspective. Uh, we have with us Mr. Mohammed Zahur Awan, who is the chairman of the steering committee for the Pakistan Workers Federation, currently the general secretary uh, and entering the trade union movement uh, many years ago in 1977. Mr. Alman was elected the provincial general secretary of all Pakistan Federation of Labor and became the central general secretary of the organization in 1990. Mr. Awan represents workers internationally and nationally. Uh, it's important to note that Mr. Awan uh, has taken part in the International Labor Conference sessions 
and was elected to represent also uh, as a member in the governing bodies of the ILO. And he's authored a book at the centenary of the ILO with the title Century of ILO's Journey Towards Social Justice and Peace, Historical Perspective and the Way Forward. It's really an honor to have you with us, Mr. Awan. Please, the floor is yours for five minutes to reflect on the questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Halshka, for your uh, kind introduction. And moreover, I am very happy to see behind you the scene of the ILO governing body room. But unfortunately, during my this session of the governing body, we could not go into this room since there was construction, I think, going on. And moreover, there was a separate room designed for it and the governing body session. And moreover, more particularly, in fact, like your question says on fundamental right and principle at work, how OSH can become one important area of that fundamentalism of the ILO conventions. So I was part of that discussion also for which I will come little later. Uh, anyhow, within the time frame, I must say that uh, uh, the OSH occupational safety and health, although very important, and sometimes no doubt in the business, employer themselves usually are very favorable to it, that occupational safety and health is one important component. But unfortunately, like uh, brother, uh, like uh, it is already introduced that in Rana Plaza and the similar state, it appeared here in Pakistan for a factory fire. During that time, almost in Rana Plaza, the casualties stood up around 1200, but in our case, it stood also uh, 380 workers dying. And moreover, uh, that factory was very much in the formal economy in which a lot of uh, finishing goods, those they are exported internationally, but then occupational safety and health due to factory fire. There was no proper rescue in which for such very precious life of the workers, they sacrificed. They sacrificed the worker as to claim their uh, workplace rights. So for this purpose also, the other very important area for us is that of the mines in which unfortunately during last almost seven to eight years, there has been more than 300 casualty when mines collapsed, mines accident happened where they swallowed the very precious life of the workers. Here in this case, what we see that uh, like in COVID-19, uh, 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 the because that is one of the background in which we have to answer also in these questions. No doubt when I was writing the book you referred, in which when I was coming on COVID-19 and the ILO convention, those they safeguarded, there are, although pandemic came, I, this uh, COVID-19 pandemic came after the century of ILO was completed, and moreover, previously 190 conventions it came, and as well as centenary declaration also, it came before COVID, but when we studied, it happened it that uh, uh, COVID-19 one way or the other is covered not only in the centenary declaration, but also on the previous ILO conventions. Let me also say that when uh, on the way forward I was writing, I had to see that which one uh, in the centenary component, which covers it, and then definitely it comes on humanitarian emergencies. There is one centenary content in which already this is very properly covered, this point, uh, when this COVID came later on, the centenary declaration was adopted. So for instance, if we go through a lot of conventions, ILO, those they cover already uh, regarding the COVID-19 and uh, the situation it arose for employment policy, ILO conventions, uh, termination of employment, ILO convention, wage protection, protection convention, compensation of workers, uh, and leave entitlement and the daily work 
as well as protection of migrant workers, which is very, very important in this connection. Like uh, COVID uh, uh, Convention 102 cover all the branches of the social security uh, during COVID-19, which uh, uh, definitely needs medical care, maternity benefit, sickness benefit, uh, employment injury, unemployment benefit, old age benefit, invalidity benefit, survivor's benefit, and family benefit. So all these are part to Convention 102. Importantly is that uh, uh, how, whether the government, they are going to ratify these convention or not. But one important component which it came is that this governing body in which I was, I was also participant. In that also we uh, already uh, uh, governing body and then it will go to ILC in June about the adoption where that ILO occupational safety and health is one important area in which it should be included in the uh, uh, core conventions of the ILO additionally, this to cover. But although as compared to where, where the discrimination that had two convention, where child labor had two convention, freedom of association and right of collective bargaining two convention, and forced labor to convention. But here then the very much important point it came from employer in which they wanted to have just two, but here workers point of view was that all occupational safety and health convention are important like mines convention, which I once, OSH, OSH mines convention 176. It is very important in terms of the mines like I mentioned in my own country, there are a lot of mines accident in which uh, we are already putting emphasis on the government of Pakistan through industrial and through international trade union confederation that this convention should be ratified by Pakistan government. But similarly, it is important on the specified convention, like on mine sector, the other one on construction sector. So these are very importantly, what we see is uh, time to come. I think my already five minutes if it has passed. So I would come definitely when certainly questions come to ask. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Owen, for that important reflection. And yes, it's a shame that all of us only have five minutes for the panel because I think we could be speaking for a very long time about these issues. They're so centrally important to the work that we do. Uh, and thank you for bringing up uh, those discussions that took place at the GB and what will continue to happen at the ILC. I agree that the selection of conventions is a very important matter. As you know very well, it has been discussed at length between constituents. And I think what is important to highlight here is that no matter what is selected as the key conventions, member states, no matter what the ratification status is of those conventions, will have an obligation to ensure that safety and health is guaranteed for workers. And so there will be also many actions that are done outside of the formal ratification process. Um, what's key to our conventions at the ILO is that there is an understanding of progressive realization as well, in that workers, employers, and governments can work together to find practical solutions to what really can be done at the country level based on the resources that we have. And it's true that while we have a number of fundamental OSH conventions, it's very important what you mentioned about the sectoral conventions, mining, agriculture, construction, the hazard specific conventions, we can't forget about asbestos, about radiation, about air pollution, and all the different elements that contribute to a worker's ill health. We know that we have more than 41 occupational safety and health standards at the ILO. It's a huge number. Um, and this is where we really have a strength of having a comprehensive approach to OSH. Not only should we be looking at the fundamental OSH conventions, 155, 161, 187, the protocol, but also all of these hazard specific and sector specific conventions that can reinforce the work that we're doing to protect workers. So thank you very much for that important uh, perspective on international labor standards. It's important that we keep that in mind for the next, um, as we go through the panel. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Wahira Palipan. Uh, Mr. Wahira Palipan um, is here with us today from Sri Lanka. He obtained his basic medical degree in 1991 and joined the Ministry of Health Services in Sri Lanka shortly after. 
Uh, he also holds a postgraduate diploma in occupational safety and health from the University of Turin in Italy, where the ILO is very active. And he obtained his Master of Science in Occupational Safety and Health, also from the University of Turin. Um, Wahira well, has a wealth of experience in occupational and environmental medicine and occupational safety and health for more than 23 years. And uh, it was my pleasure to also get to know uh, Wahira as a member of the United Nations Environmental Programs Strategic Approach to Chemicals Management as a technical expert, a uh, very important initiative in the world of work on chemical safety. So now I hand it over to you, Wahira. The floor is yours for five minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Haska, and very good afternoon to everybody. And ILO, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Every worker who leaves home in the morning thinks and believes that he or she will return home after work alive, safe, and healthy. And the household members of the same worker also think that their breadwinner will return home alive, safe and healthy. But in the reality, the situation is otherwise. According to ILO statistics, annually, 2.79 million workers die due to work-related causes all over the world. That means every 15 minutes somewhere in the world, a worker dies due to work-related cause. And we can calculate how many workers have died since we started our program. Occupational diseases kill more workers than occupational injuries do. So ideally, no one should die at work. No one should contract diseases at work. No one should get injured at work. But this happened. Why? So we are here to prevent that. Now, if we analyze the economic cost of occupational diseases, occupational injuries, again, I narrate ILO statistics, about 4% of global GDP is lost due to work-related accidents and work-related diseases all over the world. 4% of global GDP. Now take our big brother, India. Indian GDP, the world's fifth biggest economy, which is according to World Bank statistics 2020, 2.623 trillion US dollars. Chitra, if I'm wrong, please correct me. <laughs> uh, so just imagine 4% of that is lost or more than that. I think this 4% is the global statistic, but we are in the South Asian region. Our reporting systems are not accurate as in the developed world. Reporting of occupational diseases, occupational injuries. Therefore, I personally think we, in the South Asian region, we lose more than 4% of GDP in every country, in each and every country in South Asia. I personally presume it is about 6% of our GDP is lost due to work-related costs. So that is the economic impact. And on the other side is the human right aspect. So as I said, ideally, no worker should die. No worker should die at work. We don't go to work, get killed. We don't go to work, get contract diseases, we don't go to work, get injured. So all these diseases, injuries, and deaths are preventable. So people should have the right not to get killed at work. Workers should have the right not to get injured at work. Workers should have the right not to contract diseases at work. So according to my understanding of human rights, these ILO OSH standards and UN general principles on business and human rights should have been recognized much earlier as basic human rights of workers. So I have been advocating this nationally and internationally right throughout my career as an occupational physician. So I foresee inclusion of ILO or standard and UN guiding principles on business and human rights should create a win-win-win situation for all three stakeholders, all three constituents, God, uh, employer, worker, and the government. So it is tripartisan. So we promote tripartisan. So all tripartite constituents 
namely the workers, employers, and the government should be the winner if we include you uh, ILO or standards and UN guiding principles on business and human rights as basic human rights at work. So what could be the win situation for the workers? Uh, sorry, the employers. So employers will be, should be convinced that OSH is a sound investment. It is. It has a very attractive return on investment, ROI. ROI of any expenditure on OSH is very attractive. So we should convince the employers because in South Asia, our em many employers some are reluctant to spend on OSH because when it comes to cost cutting, the first thing is cut is OSH budget. So that is with my practice, with my experience in my country, after COVID-19, it was a huge economic downturn, economic meltdown. So the all employers have been busy with cost cutting. So all the budgets have been that have been allocated for OSH training have been curtailed. So that should not be the point. So OSH should be a sound investment. So employers should be convinced that OSH is a sound investment. So they will invest more on OSH. More money, more material, more men, more time, more emphasis. So this will, in return, will result in less occupational diseases, less occupational injuries, less occupational deaths, more productive workforce, less sickness absenteeism, less workman compensation costs, less labor turnover, less replacement costs for injured workers, and more productivity in terms of quality and quantity. So I will quickly narrate a very short story about uh, Sri Lankan industry, uh, Japanese Noritake. When workers work in a difficult and hot and humid environment in decorating this uh, world-class porcelain workers, this is manual skilled precision work. So they, their quality had been compromised. The quality of work had been compromised due to work condition. When the work condition have been improved, the quality of work has been improved. So see the outcome of improving OSH. So it's a win for the employer, definitely. So production went up, the quality went up. So the employer is the winner. So for the worker or employee, it will result in less diseases, less injuries, less uh, sickness absenteeism, more earning capacity, more overtime, more production incentives, more attendant incentive, better quality of life, better take home salary to home, happy worker, happy family, happy community, and happy country. So that are, those are the outcomes of improvement of OSH for the worker and definitely for the country. So as I, at the very beginning mentioned, 6% of GDP in our countries are lost due to work-related costs. If we could reduce it by one fourth, right? One fourth is feasible, I think. So how much we could contribute to our socioeconomic development of our respective countries? Therefore, OSH standards and UN governing principles on business and human rights should have been recognized as basic workers' right at work. And also our market, South Asia produces many export-oriented products, our main products are such as apparel, we have EU market and the US market. Our buyers in the EU and the US are very keen on product without guilt. They want a product without guilt, without forced labor, without child labor, with better standard of wash, better standard of living of workers, uh, social dialogue, freedom of association. So if we include ILO or standard and UN governing, UN general principles on business and human rights. We will have a better market for products in the EU, EU and the US. So we will be better off than our competitors. We have competitors from South Asia, Africa, and Southeast Asia. Our main competitors in Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, they are emerging. They are going far ahead of us. So we could, uh, 
compete successfully with our competitors if we include uh, our standard then as human rights. And also, we desperately depend on foreign direct investment in our region. So if we improve our standard and we could make our region more attractive destination for foreign direct investment. So foreign investment will love to come to a country where human rights are protected, where our standards are high, where workers have freedom of association. So let us make work together and make our region more attractive for foreign investors and our markets. So that is what I have to tell with regard to our standard and human rights. Thank you, Harsh. Thank you very much, Wahida, for bringing the evidence from Sri Lanka. Uh, I think this is a very important point that you made uh, when you were wrapping up about the foreign investment. I think that's fundamental to many of these discussions and how attractive a specific work sector looks like from the outside based on the implementation of OSH provisions. So the important distinction you made, I want to highlight about the two big impacts of occupational safety and health standards and the UN guiding principles. First of all, we know that we have a direct impact on worker safety and health and well-being. That's clear. We have the research evidence that says there's a direct correlation between the ratification and the implementation of the provisions and the amelioration of workers' conditions and their safety and health standards. That's clear. But you also brought up a very important point about productivity, about business resilience, and about the importance of having that argument also as part of the uh, mechanism for implementing these standards because productivity we saw and business resilience, especially in times of crisis like COVID, is fundamental for securing economies and making sure that we can continue to deliver to the highest degree possible. So these two elements are fundamental. We also see from evidence that a country's level of ratification of OSH standards makes it a more friendlier place to invest, as you mentioned, foreign investments, not only for foreign investment, but also for um, support from donor countries to have large scale product uh, projects uh, on labor standards and occupational safety and health. So again, reiterating your main, uh, your main uh, argument that this is a win win for all and I think that that's very well taken. Thank you very much for that. Uh, now my pleasure to move on to our fourth panelist. We have Mr. Arvind Francis. Mr. Francis has been associated with various organi organizations as an HR professional. He has been associated with the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry for the last seven years in the capacity of Assistant Secretary General. He's also the Executive Director for All India Organizations of Employers and represents this organization in tripartite meetings held at the Ministry of Labor and Employment of India. So please welcome Mr. Francis. Mr. Francis, you have the floor for five minutes to answer the questions. Thank you. So thank you, Ms. Halska. Uh, and uh, it was uh, really a pleasure to listen to all the fellow participants and uh, to Mr. Nasiruddin who made the uh, opening remarks. So uh, I'll not take much time, but I, in terms of India, if we speak, it's a huge country. And if we talk about India, we have uh, uh, all the legal framework which is required for addressing OSH. Uh, we have a national policy on safety and health and environment at workplace. And uh, the government of India also it firmly believes that without safe, clean environment, as well as healthy working conditions, social justice and economic growth cannot be achieved. And that safety and healthy working environment is recognized as a fundamental human right. Uh, we have uh, also uh, stringent labor laws in India. And the, I mean, there are various acts. The Factories Act itself, if you talk about, it takes care of the health, safety, and welfare pro provisions. And then there are the new labor codes, which are going, there are four new labor codes as per the new uh, reforms that are happening in the area of labor. Uh, there are four new labor codes which are coming and out of which one of the labor codes, especially on, is on the occupational safety and health and working conditions. So 
if you talk about the legal framework, it is there. And um, we as employees, uh, when we talk about, we also have our memberships who are basically from the organized sector. And we follow uh, all these uh, uh, acts and whatever uh, legislations which are there. And we uh, strictly follow these legislations. And uh, we find that there are also many good practices which are there. Uh, during the COVID times, we have conducted uh, good employee relations practices responding to COVID-19 pandemic. And there were various lessons learned. We found that, uh, I mean, it was conducted in organizations like uh, they were small enterprises, medium enterprises, and the large corporates in the areas of chemicals, manufacturing, auto components, and various other sectors. So we found that uh, all these organizations, they established a plant level COVID task force uh, for inspection and adherence team. And uh, there were management and union representatives who introduced the COVID protocols. There was an emergency response team. Uh, there was a bipartite mechanism such as works committee, et cetera, to facilitate the OSH. Play, and OSH played a key role in managing the impact of pandemic. Uh, there was also uh, good practices like Chai Chaska, where during the tea breaks, there were medical officers who spoke on uh, how to maintain health and hygiene and on mental wellness. And a um, lot of uh, videos were shown um, on good practices and all. So, uh, I mean, there is also, there are employers who are taking a lot of uh, efforts uh, basically to uh, see that their workers, they are not injured or there is no accidents to pay how to prevent accidents there are safety committees people are uh, very very serious about uh, doing the safety audits there are safety officers which are there in the premises and uh, we also uh, ILO conducted a uh, POT training for developing health and hygiene and uh, uh, we uh, hygiene ambassadors so AYE nominated around 11 persons for the same, and they got trained on health and hygiene as health and hygiene ambassadors. When they came back, um, they further trained a lot of health and hygiene ambassadors. So this was also an initiative which was taken during the COVID times. And there were, uh, I mean, many people from the employers uh, organizations, they got trained into that. They went back, they trained uh, number of people in their organizations. There were a lot of awareness which was created. So uh, a lot of uh, such good practices which are going on. But if you talk about uh, the key implications or to business and human rights, if OSH is added to ILO's fundamental principles, yes, if you talk about India, there would be a challenge for its implementation because it's a huge country. Uh, if you talk about the states, they have their own uh, set of rules. And uh, the challenge would be on the implementation in the terms of how it will be applicable to all the category of class of workers. Um, but I think it is it is something that uh, we should look forward to. And uh, it will we can only make it happen if all the stakeholders, they come together and... Uh, for the so that it, there is a win-win situation, as it said, and nobody wants the there should be an accident in the premises or any worker should get hurt. Um, the employees they are also serious. There are also a lot of stringent act wherein you have those punitive uh, uh, actions. Also, if uh, there is any lapse on the employer side, so everyone is careful. And uh, I think uh, going forward. Uh, it should be, I mean, included as a fundamental uh, principles and rights at work. So I'll stop here for the first question. Thank you. Thank you very much for those reflections, Mr. Arwind. And it's great to hear from the employer's perspective, uh, reflections on the conventions and also uh, on the UN guiding principles, but especially having the good practices highlighted. I think that's very fundamental to our work, is understanding what works at the workplace level, what can we um, implement in different settings based on our collected 
case studies and good practices. Specifically, I liked what you mentioned about the medical officers that could come to the workplaces to speak about the health concern and especially highlighting mental health, because I think that's something we leave out of the bigger OSH discussion often. We talk about injuries and accidents and diseases, but also we need to be aware of broader definitions of well-being and mental health, which we saw was a big impact of COVID-19, not just the hazard of the biological factor, but also the psychosocial risk factors. Thank you for that. And also to close on that note, that was excellent about the need to work together. Alone, we cannot go very far. But if we're working together in these tripartite committees and these tripartite groups, discussing actively, having open social dialogue, we can achieve much more. So thank you very much for that reflection. So what very important way to move on to our next, um, our next panel member. And now I have the pleasure to introduce to everyone, Mr. Iqbal M. Hussein, who I believe is with us in person. Mr. Hussein is the managing director of RMG Sustainability Council. Uh, Mr. Hussein joined RSC as the inaugural managing director and acting chief safety officer in September 2020. Born in Bangladesh, brought up and educated in the UK, Mr. Hussein is an MBA qualified chartered engineer who brings more than 20 years experience to this role. He joined RSC from an international retailer where he has spent the past five years developing, leading and executing the company's Global Structural Integrity Program, a pioneering program which seeks to improve worker safety by ensuring building integrity through factory inspections and remediation. We're very interesting to hear about this. So the floor is yours, Mr. Hussein, for your five minutes of reflection. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, Hauska. Uh, for in, <clears throat> for inviting the RSC to this important discussion. And thank you to uh, Mr. Nasiruddin Ahmed for the opening remarks and outlining that uh, Bangladesh's national plan on, on OSH, um, which is very um, important and pleasing to see. <clears throat> uh, being an engineer uh, and starting in construction, um, OSH, or as we used to call it in, back in the days, Health and Safety at Work Act is, is of paramount importance. <clears throat> and uh, only in the late 90s, it was very difficult to get workers to wear their hard hats. Um, but now things have improved. And uh, if you go and see a construction site in London these days, you will see people not wearing hard hats, but high face, gloves, goggles, etc. And um, <clears throat> construction used to be um, one of the worst uh, if not the worst industry for fatalities and uh, recently it's improved and it's not the worst anymore. Uh, now going to the RSC. Um, <clears throat> the RSC works towards creating a safe and trustable RMG industry that is the preferred source um, for international ready-made garment uh, businesses. Uh, for us, ensuring safety at workplaces is a core mission that we pursue. Uh, the RSC's vision is to deliver world-class sustainable workplace safety programs and to make the RMG industry a safe and health, healthy place to work. To do that, <clears throat> we work with factory management workers and international brands to create a safe and healthy environment for everybody. Apart from abiding by uh, the law of the land, we our OSH policy is very much linked to and aligned with ILO conventions like C 155, Occupational Safety and Health Convention 1981, and C 187. Our workplace safety programs are based on international best practice and follow the relevant ILO standards and UN guiding principles on business and human rights. At the RSC, in my tenure, the RSC trainers have received international NIBOSH training, uh, which was to help them reinforce their uh, knowledge and uh, of, of actual health and safety at work. Delivering safety training, workers are made aware of their right to safe work, right to refuse unsafe work, and of their responsibilities in workplace, in the workplace. And of course, they have access to remedy <clears throat> through our OSH complaints mechanism. During the COVID times, uh, since the start of the RSC, which kind of coincide 
We have managed to deliver 7,687 safety training sessions, pretty much all online. Uh, conducted 2,389 uh, safety committee walkthroughs. We received over 2,145 complaints. And in the post-COVID world, we are now very much looking forward to being able to get out into the factories and to conduct in-person safety programs, hold the all employee meetings and provide safety, <clears throat> uh, the factories, sorry, um, safety awareness to thousands of workers and factory investigations into complaints filed with our complaints mechanism. Once again, we look forward to being able to distribute the all employee booklets containing OSH messages. Uh, we distribute these booklets to all the workers at the factories. And typically we have three books. One is all about uh, safe evacuation. The second is about rights and responsibilities at work. And the last uh, is on occupational health and safety. And some of the things that we're working on at the moment um, <clears throat> is incorporating NIBOSH into our, into our work. And one of the things that we're looking at is the accident triangle. And uh, it's, it's uh, quite important to note that uh, something like a million near misses leads to one fatality. And one of the things we're gonna start doing with our factories uh, is to start an accident book, because if you start recording your near misses, um, then you can work out how to stop an accident from happening. And if you can stop that, then as some of the uh, panelists have already said, if you, if you stop accidents from happening, it leads to, to less loss of work uh, time and also it helps to improve the, the economy of the country. Uh, finally, uh, we look forward to working with the United Nations, ILO and uh, Inspector General uh, uh, Daifi uh, and to continue to support and deliver uh, OSH here in Bangladesh. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for, for the intervention. It's great to hear uh, the real life practical experiences of your organization. Thank you very much. I specifically appreciated the point about recording near misses. Uh, the ILO has been working on on the definition of near misses just as much as it looks at incidents and accidents because near misses are in fact very important to understanding what are potential hazards and understanding near misses provide a key to prevention, which is where we want most of our efforts to go in the end. Of course, we want to have proactive um, remediation when we have a problem, but if we can stop the problems from happening in the first place by capturing what happens in near misses, uh, it's very important to the broader elements of safety and health. So thank you for those very practical reflections. Uh, we've had all five of our panel members um, give reflections from their own uh, perspectives, from their own stakeholder groups, which has been very important to creating um, different uh, ideas and different opinions on how we can move forward in the post-COVID world of work. Now I want to move the focus onto our second question and look at more of the practical realities in South Asia and see how we can establish uh, the points that we made in the first part of this panel into uh, the South Asian context. So we know that the majority of workers and employers are engaged in small enterprises, sometimes micro enterprises, uh, as well as informal business environments. Many of these enterprises, many of these sectors uh, are not able to receive the proper OSH protections from the government, from different national authorities. So when it comes to informal workers, when it comes to small enterprises, micro enterprises, how can we promote OSH at that level? How can we ensure that even the most disadvantaged group of workers, women, migrants, disabled workers, workers that are facing challenges, how can we make sure that these workers also can benefit from OSH protections? How can we make sure that national OSH policies and programs work for improving the lives of all workers? And when we say all workers, we mean all workers. We mean all of those that are even working in informal and very small enterprise environments. So I would like to very much hear your reflection specifically on this question. How do we make this a reality for these workers in South Asia? 
Um, we'll go in the same order. So, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Chitra, if you're ready to take the floor, please, you have five minutes. Uh, very quickly on this health card. So we are yeah. uh, we are meant to close at around six o'clock. So I would be uh, it would be really helpful if you could uh, shorten this to around three three and a half minutes each speaker. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. I think that's a very good idea for speaker. I was going to also shorten the closing remarks, but I think if we can keep it to three minutes, as the question is very specific, very good suggestion. Thank you very much. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, first, uh, I think while Sun is putting the slide five, uh, I would like to thank uh, Inspector General for, you know, uh, making a mention that uh, of the, uh, you know, including the small enterprises and informal organizations in the National Action Plan. And also, Vairaji, uh, uh, thank you so much for bringing up the GDP thing. But what we need for MSMEs and uh, which I'm really trying to work out is a business case for safety. At the micro level, when we talk of SMEs, we, we really need that uh, uh, micro level uh, intervention. And now when, uh, yeah, slide six, uh, uh, Sun. Uh, Arvindji, thank you for, uh, you know, saying to work together and that's, that's the way forward. And we hope that being in India, we are able to uh, work together uh, to bring in safety. Uh, as we said, I mean, uh, my presentation is more about SMEs, uh, you know, the practical points. And what we push is, you know, giving appointment letters, securing their employment, giving appointment letters to all workers, conducting a health checkup, but work, informing the worker of the health status uh, is, is uh, very important. Ensuring that the ESIC registrations are available uh, to the workers on the day of employment is important. Uh, next, uh, Sun. And, uh, and many small enterprises, we find that workers are not paid twice the wages, which are stipulated in our act, but, uh, you know, uh, in our rules. But this uh, practically does not take place, and that is a need to uh, do it. Governments would require to, you know, make a template, you know, for the OSH policy by MSMEs, so as to, you know, guide them that all the necessary components are part of uh, the policy when, when they actually make it. There's also a need to define standards, you know, minimum level of training requirements. We all know, I mean, uh, I've just put the data across that workers are not so educated. Uh, they really need uh, that additional skill development or the additional safety uh, training. So it is important to uh, set minimum level of training requirements for each job profile as machine operators. We have, a, we have QPs of National Skill Development Council but there is a need to strengthen that component where education uh, is low. There's need to set safety standards for elementary and sophisticated machines. Uh, we also recommend setting up of worker assistance centers in the industrial clusters, wherein the worker is, you know, is, is uh, the safety trainings are available to contractual migrant workers. There is uh, a system of educating the worker on the government norms the scheme for working conditions, social security schemes, legal rights, so on and uh, so forth. There is also a need, you know, post-COVID, we felt a strong need, which many of our governments have done, our state governments have done, is to support identification of workers to help them in distressed situations like COVID, where uh, we saw. Another area of improvement is, you know, designing and cascading safety messages in very simple language to very small factories. Uh, in regional languages, uh, India being a large country and uh, multilingual country, uh, that's one of the areas where uh, we really need to do a lot of work. Uh, next. Yeah, so uh, the point here is that uh, we have a uh, recognizing prior uh, learning. We have this system in our place. There is a strong need to inform the workers of the prerequisites of each job profile. You know, these job profiles uh, are available, uh, should be available in the cluster. And there is a need to inform the workers so that uh, uh, they know, you know, how can they grow, how can they earn more and how can they be safe. Uh, we had a video, but obviously there is no time for the video, you know, to listen to workers' voices. We hope that there is a forum to uh, take it on further. So I'll stop here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for keeping to our time limits. And yes, I hope we can see the video another time. So now we'll move on to Mr. Awan to reflect on the question for the South Asian uh, realities. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you very much uh, again for providing me this opportunity. I will try to be in uh, within R M less than five minutes because of the time constraints. To you to help you. Although when we say two things here in the question, one is definitely on OSH, and moreover any OSH policy. I think uh, still in South Asia it lacks. Maybe I am right that there is still no OSH policy, at least in my country, maybe in India, maybe in Bangladesh, our colleagues can correct me if uh, I, uh, I stated wrong. Because OSH policy as a national, as well as to the provinces, that is very much required. And in terms of where we say to the informal workers and in the categories you mentioned, in fact, we see that uh, informal economy, when I was writing my book, I was just making it that how much informal workers do we have in the world. So the figure which came down that out of the 3 billion workforce estimatingly, 2 billion worldwide, they are in the informal economy. For instance, in the informal economy, although in India and Pakistan and as well as Bangladesh, India, the quoted figure usually is more than 80% of the informal workers. And uh, definitely in Pakistan, not less than these government statistics usually say more than 70%. So here in South Asian region, we are more than the world total informal workers uh, workforce population. On the other hand, then we see in the informal workers also, some are very much those who are forced to be put in uh, informal workers, rather they themselves work in the formal sector. For instance, it has been very properly mentioned that appointment letters are very basic fundamental right for a worker to get at the time of employment to make a relationship between his or her relationship to employer. So by this way, appointment letter is not given to how many workers, how many industry and moreover medium and small scale enterprises, which are referred here uh, in the question. So appointment letter, when it is not given, even sometime in many of the industry where sometime marble industry, even previously quoted uh, accident, those they came to our offices uh, regional offices, union, other union offices in the marble embassy in, in which handicapped they became the workers if their arm is cut while they were performing their duty for the marble things. So by this way, then it was very much impossible for them to get uh, this injury benefit and compensation because they were not, could not get any appointment letter and they were injured and there was not any legal course to invoke jurisdiction for them uh, to get this occupational accident to them. So this is tremendously very high when we see in the South Asia, in all countries, in the South Asian perspective. Now here we see that uh, informal workers, even forced informal workers, like, like for instance, the uh, factory fire, which I mentioned from Pakistan, and even the same case is there after Rana Plaza. Informal workers who died, there were total 380 casualty in the factory fire at Karachi in uh, 2014. But how much in among them was informal workers not covered under any of the protection scheme that were around more than 300. Now let we see mean that within the four war, four, uh, walls within the industry where they should get it this, that they should not be put in informality. And moreover, within the factories when you see, and more particularly in the small and medium enterprises, when you will go and see that uh, contract labor, sub-subcontract, contract, subcontract, sub-subcontract. So this is too much. It becomes then forced uh, uh, type of informal workers within the formality. Although I yellow mention came uh, where 189, 
uh, which was for this purpose and the recommendation, very strongly they are now campaigning ILO on it, that uh, uh, to put it for informal workers to the formal workers, so that they get the right for social protection, they get the right for occupational safety, and uh, they get the right for other uh, those uh, which are, because much of the labor laws in the South Asia, uh, including Pakistan, those they are governed and, uh, and enforced only in some cases 10 for when there would be 10 workers, when there would be 20 workers, where there would be factory and 50 workers. So here the informality, you can see it, how much it comes if it is not enforced. So because labor laws, those they doesn't cover. Now occupational safety and health, those they come within the factories, injuries, accidents, legal entitlement, pension, invalidity pension, different other those they come for the uh, workers who are not less than 10 or more, those they are implied. So therefore, in this such case, very highly you have mentioned, this is very important for us to see it that occupational safety and health, which is completely ignored, completely, completely ignored in most of the cases. Yes, I don't say it in medium and small enterprises where informal workers are highly uh, even formal workers, if in some very rare cases, then this is so. This is very important area. Uh, what we have seen that there comes a very this that uh, in concluding, I must say, because informal workers uh, and occupational safety and health and ignored subject uh, to them because there are not unionization also, so that they can also tell awareness to the workers in terms yes. of where OSH positive it comes. Thank you very much. Very important. Yes, very important points. Thank you so much. I appreciate all those reflections. And now we'll move on to Wahira to discuss and with those three minutes. Apologies for those uh, short times, but we want to hear from all of you before the wrap up of the session. Wahira, three minutes, please. Thank you, Ashka. I will go quickly. I will run a 100 meter burst. <laughs> so biggest contributor to the GDP is most neglected. So informal sector is the biggest contributor to our economies in all South Asian region. And that is the most neglected sector. Is it justifiable? Certainly no. It is very unjust. And we as OSH, national OSH author authorities, we should do something. And my personal understanding is we should transform this informal economy to formal through intervention. But it is very difficult. I know it is a, it is a Herculean task. So first of all, we need to have a good data on the existing informal sector. Because in the informal sector, it is we don't have quality data. We don't have adequate data on workers, the working conditions, accidents, injuries, diseases are not reported. So we should first have a database and we should have island-wide whatever the mechanism to get, collect data. And based on this data, we should have our action. So that is my first point of view, to transform the informal economy to formal economy through gradual intervention. And uh, Sri Lanka also has a very vast uh, informal sector and which has been neglected as a OSS specialist, I feel guilty for that, but it is beyond my control. And our existing uh, OSH uh, service providing network cannot cater this uh, informal sector, which is scattered, which is uh, not report, uh, recorded, not registered. And we have only 35 factory inspecting engineers and one uh, consultant occupational physician, that is me. So 36 of us cannot cater the informal sector in Sri Lanka. So we already ha have a lot of formal sector industries to cater. Then our experience, let me share the experience of Sri Lanka, the labor department. We have integrated all services into national labor inspectorate. We have a very, very effective, very efficient grassroots level functioning national labor inspectorate. We have labor inspectors, over 500 labor inspectors. We call them labor officers. They are all graduates who have been recruited through uh, competitive exam and interview. And we started training our labor inspectors or labor officers, more than 500 in basic OSH. And we have developed a checklist or checklist 
for them to take when they go for their routine lab inspection uh, to the workplaces, I would not say factories, workplace, wherever they go, their task is to take that checklist and each checklist for each workplace. So they will go through the checklist and find basic OSH needs if they are not provided. So then they are knowledgeable and trained and competent in giving basic OSH advice to such uh, workplaces in the small and medium and as well as in the informal sector. So uh, with Yoshi, I'm sure Yoshi is in the audience, uh, with Yoshi and me, we have trained 30 labor officers in WISE and WIN, well, uh, uh, WISE, Workplace Improvement Small Enterprises, uh, Workplace Improvement Neighborhood Development. I have been trained at uh, Turin, so I am a frequent traveler to Turin <laughs> almost every year. Uh, I go there, uh, I follow a course and come back and implement that in Sri Lanka. So that's why uh, Felix Martin gives me uh, li very liberally fellowships to study there. So I bring back that knowledge to my country and implement. So we have trained 30 labor officers in small and medium enterprises, a three day residential course. And the labor officer said that is the best training they had for their 30 years of uh, experience in the labor department. So Yoshi and me plan to expand this to all, to cover all 500 labor uh, inspectors. So Hashka, please convey this to my good friend uh, Manal and uh, please provide funds to South Asia for specially training of uh, uh, OSH training. And uh, we want to train these labor officers to bring them to middle level OSH specialists because they are graduates, they can be trained and they are our OSH diplomats. So they go to industries for their routine labor inspection and uh, through them, we get information about the informal sector and at the same time, they uh, cater the informal sector as well. So this is just the beginning. So we, we have a long way to go and we, we have embarked on that journey. I hope that this journey will be successful. And also the other strategy that uh, together with the health department, health services department of Sri Lanka, we have an excellent primary health care service network and we have integrated OSH to primary health care. And through primary health care uh, service uh, providers, we provide OSH to the grassroots level. So that is thank our you, strategy. Ahira. And thank, thank you. you very much for yes. giving me this opportunity. Yes. No, thank you very much for those important reflections from Sri Lanka. Again, it's great to hear the really local level reflections. We'll move on now to Mr. Arvind, please, um, for response to that question for the South Asia situation. Thank you. Yeah, uh, again, if you talk about India, there are around 63.4 million MSME units, which are throughout the geographical expanse of the country. And the MSME sector in India, it contributes around 6.11% of the manufacturing GDP and 24.63% of the GDP from service activities, as well as 33.4% of India's manufacturing output. So in India, we all employ the situation basically represents the organized sector and all the relevant labor legislations are very much applicable to all such enterprises, establishments. All the enterprises have their own safety policies duly approved by top management and they follow all the provisions of applicable laws. The challenge is how we address the informal economy. There are around 92.4% of informal workers which do not have any written contract, paid leave, and other benefits in the economy and almost produces 50% of the total GDP in India. So it's a huge, uh, uh, I mean, the, it's a very big economy. And it is a challenge for both states and employers to bring such a huge workforce under the ambit of formal economy. Now, the employers, they ensure that the workplace is free from all hazard and uh, likely injury or occupational disease, but the employer can go to the extent for ensuring the same under his or her sphere of influence and control whether in supply chain or subcontracting of job orders, but cannot ensure beyond it. So in AYE, it, what it did is it, with the help of ILO, it started a MSME help desk. And during the pandemic, we had series of webinars on various issues related to MSMEs, out of which OSH was one of the uh, topic which we had. And 
we created a lot of awareness and how they can uh, improve the OSH and other health and hygiene standards in their own uh, small enterprises. Uh, this was also an initiative wherein we take we took to basically to talk to people with the help of all those who are already in the MSME sectors who are in the informal sector to get themselves registered under the MSME and bring them to the formal economy. Uh, in India, the government has also taken many initiatives. What they are trying to do is they are trying to integrate the four major portals. There is an eShram portal. The, one of the biggest problem was there was no database which was available for all these who are in the informal economy. So they have uh, set up this eShram portal wherein uh, anyone who is between the age of 16 to 59 years and who are not covered under the two major social security, that is EPF and ESI, they can register themselves. And as soon as they register themselves, they are covered under uh, uh, rupees 2 lakhs of accident insurance coverage is given to them. And this is also set up that in future, they uh, can also uh, get the benefit of social security benefits, which will be delivered through this portal. The second is the Udyan portal, which is the uh, wherein uh, anyone who is willing to register themselves as MSME, they can do it free of cost. The th third one is the National Career Service Portal. And the fourth one is the ASIM portal, which is the Arthur Neighbor Skill Employer-Employee Mapping. So all these four portals are getting integrated. So it's basically an initiative where the uh, government of India is trying to link uh, the MSME sector with the informal uh, workers, with all those who are already skilled and all those are trying to find jobs through the National Career Service Portal. So this could this initiative will actually help a lot of uh, people who are in the informal economy, uh, basically to uh, not only move into the formal economy but through getting themselves skilled and then picked up by the employers uh, through the National Career Service Portal, but also being in the informal economy, they can uh, get the benefit of some of the social security schemes. So uh, I'll stop here and. Uh, Thank you very much, Mr. Arwind, for, for that response. We'll now move uh, to Mr. Hussein as our last panel member to respond to this question. Mr. Hussein, the floor is yours for three minutes. Thank you. Last but not least. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Uh, once again, using my construction experience, uh, I can uh, say that uh, it was very difficult for us to um, get OSH uh, into the smaller um, construction uh, outfits. It's a, it's a real challenge. And I can see that uh, through the panel discussion that uh, this is a recurring thing in all industries. <clears throat> well, at the RSC, we only cover the RMG workers, uh, the majority of whom are uh, women workers, uh, some 60%, uh, largely from economically disadvantaged backgrounds. Our experience has been based on how we promote OSH uh, formally in different uh, RMG factories. Uh, now, in the interest of time, and didn't, didn't really have too much to say on this, uh, apart from that it's important for all stakeholders uh, related to health and safety, <clears throat> that we include employers and employees uh, to create an enabling environment for occupational health and safety accountability and its mutual benefits. And I think this is something that's coming across as a recurring theme across the panelists. Uh, we have seen the meaningful implementation of OSH programs in our factories that leads to better business and mutual benefits for workers and for the business owners. So that kind of messaging does work. Uh, the challenge here is, of course, how to cascade down to small and medium enterprises and even smaller enterprises. And if I may share an experience from, from my days uh, growing up in the UK and practicing, starting my career in, in the UK, is that in the UK, all establishments who employ five or more uh, workers have to display the Health and Safety at Work Act rules uh, as proposed by the Health and Safety Executive. So I was wondering, can something similar be done across Asia to improve communications, awareness, and raise accountability? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. 
Um, so now we've gone to the end of the panel. We are running over time. Um, if you'll allow me to have a few closing remarks, then I'll pass uh, over. Stop before you go with your closing remarks, yes, uh, yes. Honorable IG, sir, would also want to uh, say Absolutely. a few words. Absolutely. No, yes, I was, I was going to pass the floor over. Yes, yes, too. Sorry. Thank you, uh, the narrator and uh, our honorable panelist. Uh, I learned uh, various experience from India, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. Uh, also, uh, RSC representative from Bangladesh. Uh, I would like to say uh, something uh, more. Like the other part of the world, Bangladesh faced the effect of COVID-19 under the visionary leadership of Honorable Prime Minister of Bangladesh, Sheikh Hasina, daughter of father of the nation of Bangladesh, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. The government has handled the pandemic situation efficiently. In the pandemic situation, the operation of most of the industries are running with maintaining COVID guideline developed by government as well as DIFI. DIFI has circulated the posters, leaflet, etc. to maintain the health protocol in factories and enterprise level all over the country. In addition, government has given the incentive to the different sector, moreover, service like telemedicine, monitoring for maintaining health protocol, special inspection were conducted by DIFI with the developed checklist and special checklist. Timely initiative taken by government, activities of different ministries and departments, proper assistance and collaboration of different stakeholders uh, the maintained properly during the COVID pandemic. As a result, the rate of infection and mortality of worker were very low. I think it is only 3%. The government of Bangladesh takes a lot of initiative to promote and implement OSH culture in workplace to meet the national and international need Bangladesh Labor Act and Bangladesh Labor Rules are on the track of amendment. Under the supervision of Ministry of Labor and Employment and with the technical assistance of ILO, DIFI has prepared a and published National Plan of Action on Occupational Safety and Health 20, uh, 21 uh, to 2030 following the obligation of National Occupational Safety and Health Policy 2030. 13. The project title Construction of National Institute of Occupational Health and Safety uh, Training and Research, which is known as NOSTI, as promised by the Honorable Prime Minister, is being implemented under the Department of Factory and Establishment Inspection. From July 2022, the activities of the organization will open new horizons for training and research on occupational health and safety in the country. The Department of Inspection for Factories and Establishment is supervising the structural, electrical, and fire safety related remediation work of triple six open factories out of 1549 factories assessed under the national initiative. In addition, under the project of DIFI, Title Selected Regiment Garments, Structure, Fire and Electrical Risk Assessment of 656 RMG Factories, 298 Plastic Factories and 147 Chemical Factories have been completed, which will contribute to lessen the rate of workplace accident. According to European Union Action Plan and ILO Roadmap, Industrial safety unit has been established in DIFI headquarters, which is in the beginning of new era of DIFI activities regarding OSH. I would like to say something child labor, 
child labor has already been eliminated from the garments industry shrimp processing industry tannery ceramic uh, ship recycling export oriented leather industry and footwear and silk industry a list of 38 hazardous works has been remained as gazette notification besides it has been decided in tripartite consultative council to add another five works named child labor in dry fish sector street based work of children stone collection carrying and crushing children working in garbage picking and waste disposal and informal and local tailoring and clothing sector to the existing list dive is following one year action plan to eliminate child labor all over the country and one year action plan to ensure child labor free karanigunj upazila besides national plan of action on the elimination of hazardous child labor has been approved by tripartite consultative council and activities are going on accordingly thank you very much thank you to all thank you thank you very much to the honorable inspector general what an honor it is really to have you with us and to hear those closing remarks i think that was an excellent conclusion to this panel i would just like to say a few words of appreciation uh, it's been an honor to be here on behalf of the international labor organization uh, we have heard many good practices from our panelists uh, that I think would be great if we could collect them and have them available for all of the constituents in South Asia to learn from, from each other. Uh, we also heard about the importance of having an integrated approach, many different levels of action in this post-COVID world, policy level, workplace level, and also at the social dialogue level. So that's a reminder of the need to make sure that we have comprehensive and integrated approaches to occupational safety and health. Um, I'd like to thank everyone here, a special thanks to our panelists who come from all different constituent groups. We heard from workers, we heard from employers, we heard from civil society, we heard from our honorable inspector general. It's been a pleasure to hear from these different constituents and it reminds us that alone we can't go very far. We need to be working together in social dialogue to achieve uh, the challenges that still remain in the future for OSH uh, as a fundamental principle and right at work. We have some questions from the audience, so they were responded in the chat. Uh, maybe you can refer to them if you have any further, further interest in this. Thank you very much to all, and I wish you all a wonderful evening. Thank you. Just cut the pain. Thank you so much.